Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Descartes' third meditation. So, just to review, in Descartes' first and second meditations, he is building up to where he is in the third meditation. So in the first meditation, Descartes doubts his three beliefs on which all of his other beliefs he thinks are based on. Right? This is sense perception, our ability to distinguish dreams from reality, and the evil demon doubt. And so this has only left him with one readily apparent belief that he can be certain of. Remember that this is the cogito, or that he is a thinking thing. Okay, and then he's able to use that to discuss what minds are, but he hasn't really come across anything else in the universe. All that he's certain is that his own mind exists, which isn't a whole lot, right? Okay, so the project of the third meditation, then, is to prove that God exists. So here, first off, we should remember that Descartes is a Catholic, and even if he's doubting everything, he still wants to believe that God exists. And he's going to try to offer a logical, rational proof that offers certainty of God's existence. Once he knows that God exists, then he can be certain that two things exist in the universe. Himself, i.e. his own mind, and God. And then he's also able to walk back his evil demon doubt. That means he only has two more doubts to overcome. And I'll get to that at the end of this. Okay, so how does he start his proof of God's existence? The first premise he offers is what he calls the causal principle. And this is a really important part of his argument. It's as follows. The cause of anything which exists must have as much or more reality than the thing that exists. So everything that exists presumably has a cause. And Descartes is just saying that that cause has to be real. It has to be as or more real than the thing that it causes. Okay, so here's some examples of this causal principle. Let's say I have an idea of a rock in my head. This idea of a rock in my mind was caused by a physical rock. This physical rock is more real than my idea of the rock, right? It's actually an existing rock out there in the world, right? Now, here's another example. A spark causes a fire, right? This is why people are no longer allowed to, you know, or should not be smoking cigarettes and then going to sleep with, uh, you know, the cigarette because it can light a fire in their house. The spark is equally real to the fire that is caused by it, right? So if there's a fire, its cause must have been real. There must have been a real spark. This is the assumption behind any arson investigation. We don't assume that a fire just appeared out of nowhere. We assume that something must have caused the fire. Another example is a parent causes a child. If you see a human being, you know that that human being must have had two parents. Unless they're Jesus, I guess, in which case they have one parent. But anyways, the point is that if you see a person, you know there must have been two people who at some point in time had sex and conceived this child. Right? So those are three examples of how anything that exists must have a cause and that cause must be as or more real than the thing. The first example, the cause is more real. The real rock is more real than our idea of the rock. In the second two example, the cause is equally real to the effects. But in none of the cases is it less real than the effect. Okay, so then Descartes goes on and he raises the issue of imperfection and perfection. And we'll see how he relates this to the causal principle in a sec. So first off, he has this idea of imperfection, right? We all have an idea of imperfection. And he applies the causal principle to his idea of imperfection and says, okay, well, I constantly experience imperfect things in the world, right? So if I draw a circle, it is imperfect because it may be slightly squiggly. If 
I buy a chair, it might be imperfect because one leg is slightly shorter than the other. Right? I'm constantly encountering imperfect things. Now he says, if I have an idea of imperfection, I must also have an idea of perfection. But where does he get his idea of perfection from? So Descartes has shown that right, we have an idea of perfection in us. And as with the causal principle, then the idea of perfection must have a cause which is equally or more real than the idea itself. But there are no perfect things that we experience in life, right? Nothing is really perfect. So there's only one perfect thing that could possibly exist, and that perfect thing is God. And he's going to take his causal principle. Okay, he says that, right, remember, if an effect exists, its cause must have been as or more real. So then God, the cause of his idea of perfection, must be as or more real than his idea of perfection. Ergo, God must exist. Right? So what Descartes says is that God places the idea of perfection in us from birth. He says that this is like a mark on us. Right, like a stamp, you know, if you, for instance, buy an Apple computer, you know that it has a big apple on it to tell everyone else in the world to buy an apple, right? God is like this. He created us all with an idea of perfection in us already. And this is like a divine inspiration or spark. It's in everyone that is able to allow us to potentially recognize the existence of God. So he says that therefore God must exist. So just to review, his premises are first, that a thing must have a cause more or equally real to the thing. The second premise is that he has an idea of perfection. And the third premise is that there are no perfect things in the world and the only possibly existing thing which could exist is God. His conclusion is then that there must have been a perfect God which created him with an idea of perfection. And so, okay, what do we know about God from the fact that he's perfect? Well, Descartes says, first off, you know, a perfect being would be om omnipotent. That's all-powerful. So um, a lack of all-powerful capability would be an imperfection. So this is one of the reasons that people are imperfect. If you get sick, you don't necessarily have the power to make yourself better. You just can drink some orange juice, go to the doctor, and hope things get better. You can't make any miracles. Well, God would be able to make a miracle because he's all-powerful. A perfect being must also be omniscient or all-knowing, right? He must be able to all uh, know everything that exists because ignorance is a type of imperfection. A perfect being must also be omnipresent. In other words, it exists everywhere and it's eternal. A perfect being must, must also be loving and good, right? Because loving is a perfection and so is goodness. And lastly, a perfect being would never change, which is tied to the idea of him being eternal, right? The need to change is an imperfection. If you're perfect, you wouldn't need to change at all, nor would you ever want to. Right? So a perfect being then would never change, much like God never changes. Now from this, Descartes says, well, there's no more evil demon. Right? We don't need to think of there being an evil demon anymore, because if there was an all-good, all-powerful, perfect God, he would not allow an evil demon to trick us. Right? So this is one of the upshots of Descartes' argument here. And so now he's proven two substances, right? Now, he has other arguments for God, and these tie to other traditional arguments for God's existence made by scholastic Catholic theologians and earlier Catholic theologians. One of them is ontological argument, which is that a perfect being must exist because non-existence is an imperfection. Ergo, if God is perfect, he must exist. This is a very problematic argument in the history of philosophy, 
and people are very leery about it, but it had a lot of intellectual weight. And so Descartes wanted to update that to get rid of some of the problems with it. Another argument that inspires Descartes is the cosmological argument, which is that all things must have a cause and all these causes must either go back forever or go back to original first cause. And we don't want it to go on forever because we call that a reductio. Things just keep going back and back and back and back. Never seems to end, right? Well, everything has a cause. What causes that cause? Well, another cause. What causes that cause? Well, another cause, right? And eventually we want to stop that process and find a first cause. And this is something that they actually get from Aristotle. Aristotle makes this argument originally, despite not himself believing in a single God necessarily, but Christians use his argument to prove God's existence. And Descartes takes both of these arguments and mixes them with his argument for God's existence. Although both arguments pop up again in other forms in other parts of his meditations. Okay, so now Descartes has two substances. He has mind, his existence is a thinking thing, and God, an absolute being which exists outside of the universe. All he needs now is to prove the third substance, or bodies. And we'll get to that in a sec. Thank you for watching.